If you have your Bibles with you tonight, and most everybody who does bring their Bible, I appreciate that. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning verse 6. Several times in the Bible, Christ is referred to as the stone. And there are many variations on that particular theme. So tonight we want to begin in Peter and see how Peter describes the Lord as a stone. In the second chapter of 1 Peter, we begin about verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. The Apostle Peter quotes here from Isaiah chapter 28, and in a few moments we're going to turn back there and read what the prophet Isaiah had to say. But you'll notice here that he begins chapter 2 talking uh, about Christians and how we are to be lively stones, verse 5, built up in the spirit, into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And so Peter is using the idea of stones to refer to individuals that are lively. We are living, we are spiritual beings, and therefore we are able to grow and we're able to uh, be productive in uh, God's house. And then he turns in verse 6 to a reference to the Messiah. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. A chief cornerstone was important in ancient times and really in many ways is still important today for the support of a structure. But back in ancient times especially, great kings and rulers, when they built monuments or vast buildings, they often used a chief cornerstone. In Isaiah, the 28th chapter, we have a reference here to this particular stone. And in the context of Isaiah 28, the prophet is talking about the people of his day and how they have decided that they don't need God anymore. Verse 14 of Isaiah 28. Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule the people, this people which is in Jerusalem. Ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell, are we in agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come upon us. God had declared punishment on the wicked that were about Jerusalem, the various nations. And so Isaiah is saying, many of the Jews are saying, that's not going to bother us. We're going to be able to be exempt from it. When there is an overflowing scourge, it will pass through us. It shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. In other words, they're not going to be under the judgment of God. We don't have to do what God says. Verse 16, And therefore, thus saith the Lord God, to these people who felt so self-confident, Behold, I lay, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. 
God is saying, I am going to act on my own. I am going to lay a cornerstone, and it will judge the nations, and there will be righteousness, and the wicked will be punished, in spite of all that the Jews felt like they were immune to that. But the chief cornerstone was primary in construction of vast and big temples and buildings. As a matter of fact, the excavation geologist in Palestine many, many years ago unearthed Solomon's old temple, at least part of it. And in that, they were unearthing what was originally built by Solomon. They found chief cornerstones that were vast. They found stones that were 38 feet long and weighed as much as a hundred ton that Solomon had placed in the corners of the temple of the Lord. Don't ask me how they got a hundred ton stone moved there because I have no idea. But the chief cornerstone was the most important one. It lay a plumb line for the others. It also helped up the vast amount of the weight of the building. It was primary. It was functional in many ways. And therefore the chief cornerstone was the stone that was laid first. Notice that the prophet Isaiah says that God is going to lay in sign his chief cornerstone. God is not relying on man to do his building. He is going to provide his own chief cornerstone. If we turn to Matthew, the 21st chapter, we see how Jesus used this in his teaching. In Matthew 21, in verses 33 and following, Jesus gave a parable to the Jews of a certain householder who planted a vineyard, hedged a roundabout it, digged a wine press, built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. When the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit. And the husband took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his own son, saying, they will reverence my son. When the husband saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and let us seize this inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these husbandmen? Well, as the Jews heard this parable, they began to catch on. A few verses down here, they even draw the conclusion they are, this, this parable is talking about us. God had built his vineyard, Israel. He had sent his prophets and servants and they had been mistreated and stoned and killed, many of them. And finally, the owner of the vineyard, Jehovah, sent his own son. And his own son is the one who's telling this parable. And verse 42, Jesus said, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, Jesus said, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you, the Jews, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Jesus here foretells the destruction that is to come upon the Jewish nation because they rejected God's chief cornerstone. Just as in the parable, the servants had taken and killed the owner's son. And so Jesus used this same idea of the chief cornerstone from the Old Testament to describe himself that God laid this stone. God is the one who sent his only begotten son. Well, now we come to Ephesians chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul is going to use the idea of the chief cornerstone again. 
In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, he's talking here, of course, about the church. And he says to Christians, and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Notice that the church is built upon the authority of the apostles. But Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He is the most important, the most significant aspect of God's house. And he says in verse 20, And are built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto him a holy temple in the Lord. Notice what we said earlier about that chief cornerstone. The other foundation stones are lined up with that one. And so Paul says the other members of the church fitly framed together with the chief cornerstone. If we aren't fitted together to Christ, then we aren't a part of the Lord's temple. And we are to be fitted together, lined up as it were, with that chief cornerstone, just as the prophet Isaiah foretold. But now going back to our text in 1 Peter chapter 2, notice that Peter refers not only to Christ as a cornerstone. But he says in verse 6, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, the elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. But notice with me carefully the next verse, verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe he's precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders did not allow, the same is made the head of the corner. This is one of those passages in the New Testament in which two words are used interchangeably that are very important. Notice in verse 6, He that believeth on him. Verse 7, Therefore those which believe he's precious, but unto them which be disobedient. To be disobedient to Christ is to not believe on him. Do you see how Paul, uh, Peter jumps from faith to obedience? And he uses those terms interchangeably. As we're going to see in all these prophecies concerning Jesus as the chief cornerstone, only those who accept him and obey him believe on him. And unless we believe on the chief cornerstone, then we cannot be a part of God's house and God's temple. But now, he speaks here of the stone which the builders disallowed. It's a sad thing indeed that the Jewish nation had all the prophets and all the writings of the prophets that foretold of the coming of the chief cornerstone that God said, I will lay in Zion. They gave, God had given them all the details about what to look for, what he would do, who he would be, what he would accomplish. And yet with all that information, when Jesus came unto his own, in John chapter 1 and verse 11, John says, and he came unto his own, and his own received him not. In essence, the chief cornerstone was delivered. UPS brought it to the Jews. But they looked at it, they heard the words, they saw the life of Jesus, and they rejected it. And they said, this will not be our chief cornerstone. They turned it down. This is discussed in a number of other passages. For example, Matthew, the 23rd chapter, Jesus mentions this. By and large, the Jewish people saw Jesus and didn't care for him. They didn't want him as their chief cornerstone. In Matthew 23 and verse 21, Jesus said, Whosoever shall swear, by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein, 
He that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Jesus condemned the Jews because they disrespected God's temple. And God's temple was the source of the chief cornerstone. It was the place where God intended Christ to be placed. Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, refers to the rejection that he received of the Jews. And in Luke 9 and verse 26, he said, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my works, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Jesus, in essence, was saying, if you reject me and are ashamed of me, then when I come in glory, I will be ashamed of you. The Jews rejected Jesus. They were ashamed of him. They would not admit him. They were unwilling to say, he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. As a matter of fact, he was rejected, and finally, when the trial was conducted and Pilate offered, what shall I do with this man? They cried out, crucify him, crucify him. In other words, we don't want him. We wouldn't have him. Put him to death. Therefore, Jesus is the rejected stone, the stone that was disallowed. In Acts the fourth chapter, as the apostles went forth with the gospel and preaching particularly to the Jews, they make mention of this. In the fourth chapter of Acts in verse 10, Peter is preaching on this occasion and he says in verse 10 of Acts 4, Be it known unto you all and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. And then the next verse. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the chief cornerstone and unless he is accepted and allowed to be in the corner of his house, the temple of God, then there is no salvation. For there's no other name, there's no other one that can be placed in that position that can bring salvation. And so the authority of Jesus certainly is emphasized in all of these references to the chief cornerstone. But we notice also, going back to Isaiah chapter 28, the prophet Isaiah spoke of this cornerstone. And in chapter 28, verses 15 and following, he speaks of the stone that is laid in Zion, and he says of it, a tried stone. A tried stone. So Jesus is not only a chief cornerstone, he is not only a rejected stone, he's also a tried stone. In what way was Jesus tried? Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Our high priest was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He went through it from the temptation of Satan in Matthew 4 to the challenges and contest with the Pharisees in open debate. He was tried and tried and tried again. And finally, in the Roman courts, he was tried unjustly, unfairly, and against the law. And he was found guilty. 
He was found guilty of that which he never did. For he was without sin. He's a tried stone. He's a stone that has been through everything for us. A tried stone then would be comparable to a stone that we can trust. A stone that we know is going to hold up when the building is completed. This is a stone that's not going to crumble. It's not going to give in. It's going to be stable and solid. Jesus is the tried stone. But notice that we also have a reference to Jesus as a stumbling stone. Back to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8. Peter says, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Offense refers to obstacles before someone's way to keep them from doing certain things. An offense is a sin against somebody. Uh, throwing a barricade in their way, as it were. But you know here that he refers to Jesus as a stone of stumbling, even to them who stumble at the word. On many occasions, the words of Jesus didn't sink in. There are occasions where people turned and walked away, as in John the sixth chapter, saying the things he are, he's saying are too difficult, too hard. We can't follow them. There are times when Jesus taught things that the Pharisees did not believe, and he was rejected. His words were rejected. Many times he was challenged. Why do your apostles, your disciples do this and do that? And how do you do this? And how do you allow that? And when Jesus answered them, many times they could not find an answer, but they walked away in disgust. Anger often took over. They couldn't explain his words. They couldn't accept his words. And so... In envy, they set out to kill him. In Romans, the ninth chapter, Paul talks at length about the rejection that Jesus found and how his teaching caused great stumbling in Israel. In the ninth chapter of Romans, we want to get, begin about verse 31 at the close of this chapter. The Apostle Paul here is talking about the Jews and why they rejected Jesus. And he says, Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why not? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The Jews looked for salvation in their own fashion. They looked for righteousness through the law of Moses. But as Jesus so quickly pointed out, the law of Moses was not the answer. It could not take away sin. And therefore, as Jesus said, I am come to do away with the law. I am come to fulfill the law. I am come to be the essence of all the law was about. He was a stumbling stone to the Jews. Now, to many people, a stumbling stone is, is a bad thing. But notice here that Jesus stood for the truth. Jesus came and told it as it truly was. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, he would say in John 14. So that those who stumbled at his words and his teaching were giving up on their only hope. They were rejecting the only truth that was available. They were turning away from God. And by stumbling upon his words, they were falling into hopelessness and sin. 
And you'll notice this particular section in Romans 9 continues. Chapter 10, Paul having described the stone of stumbling that Jesus presented to the Jews, says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. The chief cornerstone came to save the lost. They didn't understand that. They didn't accept that. And it angered them that someone would even suggest that they needed salvation. For Paul continues, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For this, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not uh, submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Or as Paul in the Galatian letter would say, the law was our schoolmaster to get us unto Christ. For he is our salvation. And Paul knew that when the Jews stumbled over the teachings of Jesus, they were cutting themselves off from the only hope they had of salvation from sin. And so Jesus was also a stumbling stone to the Jews. But now we turn our attention to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Jesus was also another kind of stone. Jesus is a foundation stone. As we saw in Ephesians, the foundation of God's house is laid by the authority of the apostles, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul takes this a step farther. Beginning in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 3, he says, We're all laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Paul here distinctly refers to the church as the building of God. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Now notice Paul here is affirming his apostolic authority. He said, God has made me a master builder. I've built this house. I've built the church. Well, Jesus said, I will build my church. But Paul is saying God has given me the authority and the power to be the master builder, to put it in, into play, to, to fulfill the blueprints, if you please. And that's exactly what the apostles did. Under the directions of the Holy Spirit, they went forth into the world and directed the church into all its different works and designs and purpose. They were the master builders of the church. But notice he says, I have laid the foundation and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. Each Christian is building a part of the church. That's kind of an eye-opening idea, isn't it? Somebody says, well, what is the church of Christ? Have you ever raised your hand? It's not a building, physical building. It's not a denomination. It's not an organization. It's not an institution. What is the church? We are lively stones together fitted into God's house. It's us. We are the church. And we each build on the foundation of the apostles and Christ the chief cornerstone. And then he says in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now that's crucial. Going back to Isaiah 28, the prophet said, Israel was trying to do things their own way. God says, I'm going to lay a stone in Zion. I'm going to bring a chief cornerstone that's going to make the difference. It's going to be righteous. It's going to be just. And Christ came into the world as that stone that was rejected by the Jews, that was disallowed of the builders, 
that was tried through all kinds of temptation and troubles that was offensive to the Jewish people in many instances as they turned away from him. But that Jesus Christ today is the only foundation the church will ever have. We just sang that song, didn't we? The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. We sing about the foundation. The foundation that can't be moved. The foundation that is of God, not of man. No other foundation can ever be laid. And that's why we call it the Church of Christ. What else would you call it? It's His. It's built on Him. He's the chief cornerstone. He is the one that saves the church. Ephesians 5, He's the Savior of the body. And so tonight, Jesus Christ, the stone of God, that was sent to provide salvation to all mankind. But in order to bring that salvation, that stone had to suffer immense difficulty, had to suffer rejection and mocking, and people were ashamed of him. But may we never fall into that category. Maybe when he comes again, he will not be ashamed of us because we've not been ashamed of him as our foundation. If you're here tonight and need to render obedience to Christ, he is the chief cornerstone. He is the one foundation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. God sent him to us for his church to be founded upon and salvation to be purchased through his sacrifice as we stand together. <clears throat>